without uh, further ado, I think it's about time to get started. So I'm going to mute everyone. Uh, from what I understand, everybody's going to either there is going to be a recording here. It is recorded. So if you want to break it down afterwards, let me know. If there are issues, technical issues with seeing the screen, hey, Brian, um, let me know. But here, what well, we're going to go through, and I've gone through this question before, some of you might know, but it's good to see a breakdown of it live. So what are we doing here? Let me share my screen real quick. Does everybody see this here? Yeah, I think it's clear there. Good to go. Yeah. So what do we what what do we have here? Okay. So um, essentially what we want to do is recreate something like this where you have a certain amount of boxes, let's say six. And as you click every box, it turns green. And when you get to the very end, when I click the last one, you can see here that it starts going backwards from where it started. So I'll do that again. So it'll start from here then go backwards in reverse order to where I clicked it. So this is a variation of that question. It was slightly bit more complex, um, but this is kind of like the gist of it. Um, uh, raise hands, anybody seen this kind of question before or practice for a question like this? It's uh, it, it was a text screen question, specifically it's front end. Uh, I decided to do it in React JS because that's what I'm good at. It's not always the best choice. I recommend the first thing you do in interviews is the person might, you know, say, do it in whatever you want, but you know the company does it in React and you're not that good at React yet. I would be very, very careful about doing it in React. And the reason is you're always going to fall back to the level of your training when things get instinctual and they get instinctual because you get nervous because there's going to be some, some, some bubble on the screen with a person you haven't met before. They could be nice. They could be just straight faced and they make the decision about whether you get the job or not. So it's good in these situations to use what you're best at. So if you're better at vanilla JS, just use that. If you're not, if you're better at react, better at you use that, ask to use it. A lot of times they'll, they'll let you use it because they want to see how you think. Very rarely would they want you to do it in vanilla JS. I was probably just asked one time to do that at a big company is like they forced me to use vanilla JS. They didn't want me to use react. And maybe they just wanted to see how good I was. So that's the starting point. The second thing here is when you look at a question like this, how do you approach it? How do you solve it? The first thing I tell people or even tell myself is, you know, I need to make this as small as possible. Some people might ask you questions like, for example, like make Twitter for me, build Twitter for me. How would you build it? The worst thing you could do is just say, yeah, like let's start. That's not very good because you've just force yourself to create every feature of Twitter, chat, message, you know, chat, uh, spaces, notifications, followers, search, you know, all these kinds of algorithms. Like, you know, what you should do is try to quantify it. Be like, do you want me to create every aspect of Twitter? Should I create just the basic follower system? What do you want me to do? And that's when the interviewer will usually make the question smaller and smaller. And that's what I try to do here is I'll ask something like, okay, is it going to be more than six squares? Is it going to be one color? When I click, when I go through all the colors, is it actually going to go back? And, and does it, does it have to have this kind of slow kind of reverse order? Can it just be all at once? So they'll tell you like, no, I want it to be a little slow when it goes back. I don't want it to happen all at once, but I don't want any fancy animations. I don't expect more than like six boxes uh or to grow that way so that kind of gives you a glimpse into what they might expect because if they ask you to do it for a thousand boxes you might have to adjust the way you do it so that's how i usually approach these problems so the second thing i do is i try to walk through a potential solution with the interviewer the interviewer could be your biggest enemy or your greatest friend depending on how you uh kind of ask questions what i like to do is it's kind of comes off as a little bit not confident, but I always like to ask them if things make sense. Almost to my own annoyance is I'll run through a potential solution or how I'm going to approach it and then ask if it makes sense. Example here, I'd say, well, I think that we need to keep track of every box being clicked since 
you want to go in reverse order. I think the order matters. So we might have to track it. And I might be thinking of, I guess, an array because it's going to be a unique box. I, maybe it has an ID. Every box is unique. We can give an ID like one, two, three, four, five, six. So whether you click, uh, you know, this box, it'll be one, two, three, or you can start from zero, whatever you like. But this one would be three and this one would be five. So that would give it a unique ID. And we need to keep track of it somehow. I'm thinking an array is OK. So I'll ask, does that make sense? And my, this, sometimes they might say, like, yeah, I think that's a good approach. Or sometimes they may be like, uh, you know what? Think about this. And you'll be surprised how much they help you. But if you just commit to a solution and just go for it, and if the interviewer doesn't understand your solution, sometimes people walk through it a bit quick for me when I'm trying to interview people and I kind of don't get it. And I, I sometimes I take a step back. Sometimes the interviewer will just let you, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, dig your own grave in, in that sense. They just, they, they let it, they let you just do whatever, right? And they expect you like, oh, okay, this person, they should be able to figure it out. If, you know, they do the wrong approach, let's see how they recover. I, on the other hand, I like to just, Kind of dial it back and be like, are you sure? Did you think about this and this? Depending on the interview, of course, and the level that we're looking at. So, uh, so this is the standpoint of a senior developer or even not a senior developer. I think these are good questions to ask in general. So, let's see now how we can go through this problem. So, I'm going to keep track of it in an array. And then when I've reached the limit of six, I will try to remove them from the array one by one. So if I have an array representing this data and I have six elements, I will fill them out according to the order I click them and then go backwards and kind of get rid of that. So that sounds like from a theory perspective, probably correct. And that's when you should kind of go ahead and approach the problem. But there's even one more thing. So now you know the complete solution, but I highly recommend not doing it immediately. The biggest thing I like to do is get very small wins. The first thing I like to do is just print something. So I'll show you here what I mean. So uh, let me share my other screen here. So we'll get into the uh, code demo. All right, so we'll start with something empty. So this is Stack Blitz. I really like it. Um, it's like Code Sandbox, but a lot faster. I'm not sure if uh, how many of you have heard of this, but this is what we'll be using to do it. You can create your own React environment here very, very easily. Uh, you can sign up on GitHub, anything like that. And uh, I find it very good for demos and pretty fast. So small wins. The first thing I'll be looking at and telling the interviewer is maybe I'll just create a single square on a screen. So maybe we could do that. Like so. How can we create a square? And that's another question I'd ask. I'd be like, is the CSS matter? I might not put this in a styling file right away, but I would usually do that. Is that OK? And they'll be like, styling doesn't matter. Don't worry. Or they might be like, yeah, it does matter. So ask these kind of questions, because now that I've asked that, I gave my, I, he's, you know, he or she or what or they have given me permission to, uh, to just sort of, um, you know, add, uh, add it the way that I want, you know, like instead of maybe adding, you know, creating extra time for me because you're always losing time in interviews. So if I can just add them directly here and instead of a style sheet, it could save me some time, for example. So we'll go ahead here and we'll create a simple square. So um, we could do it in line in CSS. And again, this is JavaScript and uh, it, is a, it is a TypeScript file, but I'll be writing in JavaScript because I think more people know JavaScript than, uh, than uh, you know TypeScript. So we'll give it a border. Make it like this, and we'll give it a width, dpx, and a height of dpx. So let's see what we get here. And yeah, these are mistakes you'll make throughout the interview. You know, it's OK. Um, and let's see here. So I don't have something working. So we try to figure out, like, oh, OK, did I spell something wrong? Did I do something wrong here? So. Order is good, height, and feel free to correct me if you see it. So I might have had a typo there. Perfect, right? So these are OK. It's important. That's why if you don't see the results right away, you might make some very silly mistakes. And it'll become very hard to recover later on once you had the, you know, the program going. Because a program is harder and harder to debug the more you uh, introduce code to it. So now you know, like, OK, well, I know my square works. So let's. 
make a green as I click it. So in React, uh, generally we have uh, use state available. So I don't know why they do kind of this way, but I like to do it this way instead. So we can create a state variable here. And what I want to do here is call it background uh, color here. And I would like to use a Canadian spelling, but I can't because uh, uh, you'll see why here. It was kind of forced by CSS, but let's call it transparent. And here I'll add, uh, I don't like that it doesn't auto style, but uh, we'll, you know, it is a pet peeve of mine when it's not auto styled here. I usually use prettier. You know, and these are things to like fill out the gaps when you're interviewing. I just talk about random stuff like that. Just maybe I'll get a chuckle out of them, build some rapport in the meantime. Maybe it annoys them. I don't know. But, you know, maybe it like calms my nerves too, just to talk things through. So background color here is a CSS property. And it starts out with transparent. So let me make it green. Let's see if that works. Perfect. Okay. So what I want to do is when I actually click this button, how do I make it green? So we need a click handler usually in React to, to help us do this. So we've got our style, right? Uh, let's add our click handler and we'll say on click equals to, let's say, uh, set background. So something like this might happen. Sometimes in interviews, you might do this a lot here. And you'll be like, okay, set background green. And you'll see too many re-renders. This is a common kind of mistake in React uh, that that I make. Uh, and um, what's happening here is this is not wrapped in a function. And when it's not wrapped in a function, it's going to run every single time. So you got to be careful. So something you do is just do this, which is just wrapping it in a function. And you'll see that it works. So if that confuses you, this anonymous function, that's OK. We can just do on click uh, button or square. Maybe you should have called it, but that's OK. So we can make a function here. And uh, what you'll see here is okay. and uh, we'll set the color to green when it's clicked. So you see this is a function here being called. We don't call the function directly. We don't invoke it. React will invoke it for us when we click it. So very simple thing that I've done here. You know, haven't accomplished much. Um, uh, this could be a junior developer question. Maybe, maybe sometimes what they might do in a, in a in an interview is give you an, a very hard question, but not have different expectations for different levels. So they might expect me, for example, to finish it completely and to add improvements. They might expect somebody at junior level just to attempt it and see how far they get. It depends, right? So uh, now that we've created one square, well, I know I need to now create six squares. So I can either write this six times, or in React, I can make it a component and write it six, and show it six times. So that's the next step. Uh, this is stack blitz. Uh, I'll write it down here. Okay, uh, it's a very great platform. So let's go ahead and create six squares. So how how would we do that? So I would say that let's make another component. And I would say I usually put this in another file, but I'm going to do it here for demonstrations and time purposes, just like we have now, like we're running out of time. So I'll do squares here. And uh, just declare it as a function. And I'll have a return. And inside of here, I might put this exact same code here. So let's see. All right. And uh, I put that inside the return I shouldn't have. And I copied the return. Maybe added an extra one. See here, it does auto format it sometimes, but not the way I like. And uh, we want to call this function right here. So we want to call square, not squares. Okay, and I and I've and I've made it uh, capital just so that uh, you know the it's kind of like a a React kind of pattern or how we do things in React or or kind of a formality. And then I can remove this here because now it's in the component. And now I have a single square that gets clicked. But now I want six. So here's a method that you can do. So if you want to create six of these, what I'm going to do is I need it to be in an array, in, in an array of six. Uh, one trick that we can do is just create a fake array or just an array that like could be just a random array and plug it in and, and just let it you know, repeat itself six times. So you could do like a for loop, uh, for example. But here's the technique that, that I kind of like using. So I'll show you this real quick. So let's see here. 
Um, let's see if I can get this done with no errors the first time. So call the method array, fill it up six times, and do a map. And then um, I don't really care about the first element inside of it, like because it's going to be undefined, and I'll show you that in a sec. And in there, I'm going to call a square. So let's see if this actually does anything. Right. So in this case, a complain. Let me put it inside a div just in case. So let's see here. What's going on? Do I have? I have to close this. Now that's the the fun in coding live. You're always going to have some problems, which is part of the fun, to be honest. So I have an array. I did a map on the array. And Missing a bracket inside the map. There we yeah. go. Perfect. There we go. Thank you. So sometimes the interviewer might actually help you with these things. You know, when they see you struggle, some don't. I like to because it, it's just a matter of being in front of people and uh, you getting nervous, the more uh, you kind of um, don't get it, the more it doesn't become clear to you, the more you panic a bit. So the interviewer might end up helping you. So that's what I found, like, just like, uh, you know, whoever helped me here, they, I think it was Richard. Thank you very much. So anyways, so now let's see here. We're clicking six squares, and now they're all clicked. Perfect. Okay. Uh, one key thing here, if this confuses you, this is just an array. Uh, so I'll show it to you real quick how this looks like. Because I don't know like the level of, uh, of everyone here in terms of like their understanding of JavaScript and everything. So I uh, apologize if this is apparent to you, but I feel like it's important for, for others. Okay, so let's see what this array is. As you can see, it's just an array of six here. And it's just all undefined. So it's just basically letting me have an array of six. And in my map, I have an underscore here, which denotes like I don't care about it. Uh, generally in React, it will complain. I don't see the, the thing here, but you have to provide a key when you're doing in uh, any kind of uh, iterable. It's just something for React to kind of keep track of and update. It might not be important here. Maybe that's why I didn't complain anymore. But uh, right now we have six squares. But now we face a problem. You know, As I'm clicking through, how am I going to keep this order? How am I going to do that? So if I remember back to my original solution, I said that I'm going to create an array and keep track of which one I clicked. OK, so where do I need to create this array? I can either create it in the square, which doesn't really make much sense to me, or maybe at the top level, right, where all the squares are. So we can go ahead and create a square that's clicked, set square that's clicked, equals u state, an empty array. So this is where I'm going to keep. This is where I'm going to keep track of everything. So essentially, what I want to do now is fill this out. You know, I'm going to have a console.log here. I want to fill this array out as I click it. Oops. Okay. So it should be empty to start, which is what I want. But how do I fill this now? So every time I click on a square, I want to be able to add the index of that square here. So one thing I could do here is add an onclick handler on the square. And this onclick handler will then uh, bubble up or go up to the main component and enter it in the index. So uh, let's see here. What I can do is pass this onclick square. And I probably will need to pass this up. And uh, you know, apologize if I'm going a bit too fast, just in the interest of time here. Uh, and now it's complaining because it doesn't exist on my actual square component. So um, when this is actually clicked, I wanted to uh, invoke this method. So it's gonna when it's when the button is actually clicked, or sorry, the square is actually clicked, it's gonna go up. And it's gonna go up to the original component, and in it, uh, what I want is the index. So I have to pass that index. So I'm gonna do a little tricky thing here. Pass the index. So now I have the actual index available. And I'll show you what I mean. So console.log index. So let's see if that works here. Oh, I'm not getting the index here. So let me see the possible problem. So the index comes from here. Uh, it's originally empty. Hmm. I need to think about this a little bit here. If you see the problem, please let me know. Um, the index should come from here. 
the index on click square here and I might cheat a little bit and look at an earlier solution because sometimes this stuff just happens. Uh, let's see. Oh, this oh, okay, okay. I think I know the problem here. So actually when I when I put index here, this this is actually a completely different thing. The index comes from here, not from here. When I make a new function, I confuse myself there. So let's see here and perfect. All right, now we see that we're actually clicking everything. Uh, when we click, we get the actual index. So now we're making some progress, all right? Like, so, uh, uh, oh, can everyone hear me? Or is that just the... Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, good, good. Just making sure I saw something there. Okay, so, so far, when we click on the, the square, we can follow the index. Now we need to store that in the array. So that's gonna be the key part because that array is gonna tell us in which order it was clicked. So here we can simply just use what we have in React like this. So let's see if everything updated. It's gonna update. So, oh, so I'm adding to a square split array, but I'm adding the index. So this is an array that I need to add to. So technically I need to add it to an array. And here I use a concat method. So concat, why I use it is it's gonna make a brand new array, which is important from an immutability perspective. Uh, if you don't use that in React, sometimes you run into problems. So let's see now, okay, perfect. So as I'm adding it, we can see that things are printing here. Perfect, okay. So now we have the exact, uh, well, we have, a, we have the exact um, kind of order. So um, what's gonna happen here is there's a problem. The problem now is that I can anticipate already that if, this is done and I remove items from from here automatically. Like if I want to remove something from uh, like, like, like return this back to the original color, it's not going to work because the color is controlled by the square component right here. The state is in the square component. So the color needs to be controlled by this component. In fact, it needs to be controlled by the squares array here. So if it's in here, then it should be colored. If it's not in here, it should be transparent. So this is a very important point uh, because like as I remove it from the array, it's going to have no effect. So you could see here that um, if I actually uh, want to remove it and uh, let's for the best example to go through here, let's see. If I try to remove something here. Um, actually, you know what? We'll go through and do this because we're running short in time. But um, what I'm going to do here is let the actual array of uh, squares clicked control um, the colors. And how I'm going to do that is here, I'm going to do a little formatting here, I'll just make it more clear, is I'm going to um, pass the background color from here. And how I'm going to do this is I'm going to say, if the index is included, in here, then make the color green, otherwise make it transparent. And this is a ternary operator. I'm not sure if people have seen this. So it's complaining that the background color is not available. We'll add it here. And now we can remove it from the state completely. And now let's see here. Perfect. So that could be a bit tricky. Um, the people kind of, you know, maybe thumbs up if uh, you get it, maybe you don't, that's a bit okay. I know it's a bit of a tricky point, but what I'm trying to do is control the color from the top level because as I remove them, I need them to be removed. Okay, perfect. I guess uh, uh, I'm a good explainer or y'all just smarter than me, which I, I always believe, <laughs> um, or a, bit, a little bit of both. So now uh, this might complain, this is a bit of a TypeScript error here, don't worry about it. Um, but uh, uh, now the color's control from here. So now we have the order of the array but now we have to remove it. And we have another problem actually. Um, as I click these, you can see that it keeps adding to it. Uh-oh, like we have way more than we need. So uh, this is another thing that we have to watch out for. So as I click it, I'll say the same kind of logic. I'll be like, if the index is already included, if the square is already in there, so what I'm gonna do is, um, uh, not allow it to go through. So I'm going to return. Let's see if that works. So hopefully it does. So now as I click it, it 
shouldn't increase. Perfect. Okay, so we got that one problem out of the way because if we have way more, then it's not going to remove it as I remove them one by one. So now here comes the interesting part with React. And why I always think like vanilla JavaScript is, is easier sometimes, uh, or I think that it's easier for this type of question. Um, React is a bit tricky because when we reach the final, um, when we reach the final square, uh, React usually is asynchronous. It doesn't happen right away. So what I mean by that is if I log here, where it's clicked, a length, right? And the length that we, the, the, the final length is going to be six. Here's what's going to happen. So when I first click it, it says zero, then one, then two, then three, then four, then five. So it's always one behind because React is, um, yeah, it's a TypeScript error, don't worry. Um, uh, it, it, because it's like a, the type, I have to define the type. So don't worry about that. We're just doing it here from a JavaScript perspective. But what's happening here is that React is always one behind uh, because it's asynchronous. Like set squared right after it, it's not it's not guaranteed to be done. In the old kind of version of React and in, in, in class components, we used to have set state. We used to have a callback on it. We used to be able to, after the state was finished, we used to be able to update it. And now React wants you to do it a bit different. Um, I prefer um, listening in on a variable when it changes. And we specifically do that with use effect. So use effect here, how it's going to be used. It's going to tell us when these squares change. So let's do it right here. Let's use use effect. And we're going to listen in on squares clicked. And here, I'm going to log the squares that are clicked. So I'm going to remove this one right here, and we're going to go like this. And we're going to see now, hopefully, uh, oh, I'm going to do the length, actually. Now, the length is accurate, and it's firing off after my original console.log. So uh, that's here. So now you can see that we're actually tracking the right number. So now we can actually say, if we reach the end, which is six total. Now we can go back and remove something from the array. So I know this is uh, kind of going a bit on time. Sorry about that. I know I, I, I rehearsed it a few times, but uh, I do end up filling up a lot of my own time, but I'll try to go through this while trying to explain as much as possible. So let's see now. So now we want to uh, remove something from here when we reach um, six. So squares collect dot length equals six, which is the limit. I want to be able to say uh, we we reached and again small wins here. I just want to make sure this works. Perfect, right? So I know I'm at the end. So now I know I want to remove something. So how do we remove something from an array? Well, we know we want to go in reverse order. So reverse order usually means the last thing that's added. So so if we're going from this order here, you know five was added first. I want to remove in this case zero first, the first element that was added. So one way you can do this is with pop. Um, but it's a bit tricky here because uh, I like to make a copy of the array so we don't mess up the React, uh, we don't mess, mess up the actual React state. So what I'll do, I'll do something like this, okay? Um, and what we'll do is we'll do a new array dot pop. There's a few ways to do this. This is something I experimented with today and looked like it worked. So we'll go this approach because the other approach with slice could be a bit more complex. So let's see if this works here. So this now should remove um, the last item that I added. Perfect. And why you're not seeing it is because it's like flashing very quickly. Um, if I added a set time, if I added in a set timeout, you would probably see it. So this is the this is the kind of the most interesting part, and this actually never comes to me. Um, this actually never comes to me kind of regularly. But what I do notice here is like, oh, I need to remove the last element in order one by one, and I need to keep doing this until the array is empty. So almost like if I put this exact logic in a function this exact logic of removing the last one in a function, and I do it until the until the array is empty, 
I can accomplish this. So if I put this into a function, so this is scream anything to anybody, like like a particular pattern. Maybe some of you are more, uh, you know, this comes to them more apparently. But does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's almost like you're calling something again and again until it until you tell it to stop. There we go. Recursion. There we go. So it's a bit recursive. So let's see how we can use it here. So if I actually, um, what I can do here is create a function. called remove uh, last element or remove last. And here, what I could say is the exact same logic, right? So I take the array, I make a new version of the array and I pop it out. And at the end, I call it again with a new array. I'll call this here the current array. Right. And then I make a brand new array. So remove last, hopefully should have this exact same logic. So let's say. Well, I don't want to get into an infinite loop very quickly, so I'll actually remove the recursion part. So let's see if this actually works here. Perfect. So the exact same logic I added. So let's see now here. I have to be very careful because th there needs to be a condition where this finishes. It's very important in recursion, or else you might get into too many renders. Stackwiz is actually very good at not crashing. Some things are not very good at not crashing, and, and it'll crash, and it'll be in an irrecoverable state in your browser, and you'll have to like almost open up a new tab sometimes. So let's say here, if current array dot length zero, return. So let's see what happens here. So hopefully this works. Nice. So I think that it actually removed them in order. But what's happening is it's kind of flashing very fast. And what we want to do is achieve that slow kind of kind of way of doing it. So this is actually like one of the you know few times that sometimes recursion makes kind of like it's not that it makes sense, but it's like more intuitive because we're doing the same thing until a condition stops. So how can we now uh, do this? Like like, like add a little delay. One way of doing this is with a set timeout. So we can do a little set timeout here. We can call a function and let's see what happens here. Nice. Well, you see there's kind of, an, this is kind of annoying because as I click this, the, the last one kind of flashes. I don't like that. So uh, maybe I could do uh, maybe I could do it here as well. This is like for the very first one. So let's see if that works. Okay, so nice. It works. but I don't I don't like to set time up that much in the way it's being used. It's kind of like, um, it's not as elegant as I like it. I like to add a, like a more artificial delay. Uh, does anybody have any ideas for that? It, we could still use set timeout, but we're going to wrap it in something. So. Await, async await. Yeah, we could use async await utilizing a promise. So uh, one thing that we could do is I'll just copy this over here because it's just easier here. I never remember the syntax. But if I created a artificial delay like this, which essentially is just a set timeout <laughs> wrapped in a promise, I can make it wait 500 milliseconds or whatever I want. I can pass it in, but I can get away from this more like uh, kind of like less elegant approach in my opinion, uh, because uh, especially when you have to do it there in the beginning. So we'll add that in and we'll say that we'll uh, actually have to add async to this. And then after, before we set the squares, we can delay, we can await. Let's see what happens here. Will this actually work? Nice. OK, so there you have it. <laughs> That's uh, something here that uh, actually works. Um, 
I am going to share the link with you here. I don't know if you can actually use this or not, if it actually shows up or uh, the original, another approach is with a code pen that I had, um, but there you have it. So essentially what you saw here is kind of a walkthrough uh, of a problem that I, I actually kind of had and, and didn't do as well as, as I obviously showed here because I've gone through it a lot, but I want to show you a bit of techniques. And the main thing that I wanted you to get out of this is just like the approach to the problem, quantifying the problem, discussing the solution, uh, talking about like different things in React that you could use, different techniques in JavaScript. Because I struggled a bit with the recursion. The guy, I remember he helped me a bit. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we can use recursion. Some other people won't help you um, with those kind of things. And I think like my friend, he did the same interview, you know, another tech screen, and the person wasn't as nice. So you never know what you're going to get. But I do want to open up. Q and A here. Um, I know we're until four forty-five. I don't know if it closes automatically, but I'm gonna be. I can be here. Uh, you know, close to um, uh, close to the end of the hour. I know it's different time zones for people. It's four forty p.m. for me here. So um, it could be related about this. It could be related to um, uh, you know something else. But uh, please, um, let's go in order here. Um, and maybe like let's say you can write it down here, or you could say I want to speak up. And uh, I, I can um, and, and I can answer. So um, let's see here. I know uh, Brian has a question here. I'll start off with that. But let's say through here, I'll start. Um, if you do have a question, just like maybe do a raise hand emoji or something like that if you would like to speak. So Brian um, uh, is asking, normally, how long does the interview give you to go through this question? Uh, I got an hour. Uh, typically, you will get an hour um, to like like 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on the level or expectations that they want. Um, so obviously this question, uh, you know, wasn't asked for me at Shopify where I currently work, but the, what I got asked at Shopify, I got a bit more time because there were more expectations from the pair programming session for the position I applied to. Um, sometimes for a tech screen, they might give you something that's a little less more complex. Um, uh, so like uh, it, it all depends, but let's just say about an hour is typically what you're given for a text screen question. The recording will be available, no worries. Um, that's something Code Mentor I believe will handle. Um, let's see here. Uh, that was Karun. Let's see here. Um, Dan says, where can one practice React type interview questions? So React type themselves, I don't think. You know, I, I know a very good place, but I do know some good front end questions that you can practice. Uh, this is a guy called uh, uh, Mike Lee. He has this website that's pretty cool that he created called Front End Eval, and it has some pretty cool questions. So uh, please take a look here. This is a, a pretty good resource. Was this interview for a junior role? No, this was for a senior role because that's what I'm applying to. But I tried to give you something, of, you know, just to give you an idea about something they might ask you to do. Sometimes they, you know, for a junior role, they might ask you to do this in longer in a longer period of time. Maybe they don't expect you to do uh, go as far with it. It all depends. Is it possible to start freelancing with only HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? Of course, um, uh, a lot of websites, like most of the websites that, that are around the web are in WordPress. And you can do a lot of stuff with WordPress with only HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I mean, it's nice to know PHP. Uh, so yeah, that's something I, I was like a kind of back in the day, they used to call it webmaster and I used to do some edits on people's basic sites, stuff like that. Have you seen a lot of interviews asked to use Redux instead of use state? Uh, no, generally they ask you to use what you're comfortable with. Uh, I specifically would say I would not use Redux for this question. And the reason is I like to keep it simple. Uh, I only like to use Redux when it's needed. In fact, uh, Shopify we use a lot of GraphQL uh, in context. Uh, GraphQL makes it a you know makes it easier to kind of grab what you want in any component a lot easier. So we don't see a lot of Redux. So um, although it is uh, probably used in other repos, you have lots and lots of repos. So yeah, like, but yeah, I wouldn't use it unless I really needed it in a project. Except that the interviewer can be helpful and guide you. But what can you do if you got a not so helpful interviewer? That's you know. There's nothing you can do. You don't choose your interviewer. You just got to show up, talk as much as you can, do whatever makes you feel comfortable, get these small wins going. You know, I, I would say the most 
cold people you get in any test are in Ontario and Canada here when you do a driving test. Uh, this person will sit beside you in your car and not make a single facial expression. I've never seen anything quite like it. And uh, I've never seen that to be that brutal in tech, except for one time I interviewed for a company and the, the person was very brutal in, in their emotions and their answers. And it just happened. I mean, I was annoyed. I was bothered by it, but there's nothing you can do. You just got to move on. Karun says, will there still be a leak code before you are asked a front end question like this one? Actually, so that's interesting. Sometimes in big companies, they avoid asking you uh, leak code questions for front end interviews. Um, I know that uh, some companies do that, like uh, Facebook. Uh, you know, I made that mistake by not saying I'm front end. I said I'm back end because that's what they had available and they asked leak code. But other people are saying, like Dan Abramov, they won't ask those type of questions. I know Uber doesn't. And many other companies don't ask those kind of questions. Uh, especially for front end, or not at all. Um, yeah, the drive says flashbacks. To clarify, how long do these interviews last or how many days? Well, after the tech screen, so after I did the tech screen, after about an hour, uh, they reached out and said, you pass, let's do the main interview, which is a few rounds. So those few rounds typically in big companies last around four to five hours. Uh, you'll have things like um, a system design maybe, uh, maybe um, another kind of code pair programming question, something maybe more behavioral with a manager. It really varies per company. And sometimes they're a lot harder. Sometimes you'll find it easier depending on what you're good at. And they'll have this for bigger companies. I know in, in our startup, what we, you know, in the startup I work for, the interview basically uh, for beginners was more of a take home test in the beginning if you wanted to do it. And then from there, we discussed the take home test and do a couple more questions. We had the screening that was a lot easier sometimes. We experimented with a lot of different things. Sometimes the screening was just half an hour, very, very simple question compared to this. And then afterwards, we do things like whiteboarding and um, maybe another like live coding session that's the, for beginners different than uh, more senior positions. Let me know if this is too vague. How do you do, how do you deal with an event or action not being able to render after multiple clicks? For example, a drop down expanding a list. Um, that seems specific, but I'll try my best. Um, whenever you, this is like debugging, right? Whenever you have a problem with something not rendering after multiple clicks, you gotta figure out like, where did the problem come from? And that's when debugging comes in handy. And that's when debugging is a process of isolation, isolating the problems, like figuring out where this could this problem come from? and then going through and pursuing those kind of, uh, let's say hunches or those guesses about where the problem might be. Because here, this problem could be anything. I haven't seen it. I don't know the details about it, uh, but if I did, that's what I would do. You know, Break it down, make some guesses into where the problem might be come from, and then go try it out. I use a lot of console.logs. I'm not really a big debugger user, and uh, some people might look down on that, okay, but uh, that's what works best for me. And I know a lot of top developers, and when I, I actually read a book called uh, Quarters at Work, uh, and uh, a lot of people had those um, uh, kind of same, uh, kind of the same, kind of the same workflow where they just use a lot of print statements. Uh, okay, I think I answered if this question is made for a junior developer. You might get it as a junior, you might not, you never know. Uh, but I hope I clarified that, uh, John. Uh, or you might not be expected to finish it. So Brian, using today's interview question you showed, if one gets stuck, are you allowed to Google in front of the interviewer or is that a bad thing to do? Great question. Uh, interview, usually in interviews, they allow you, I think like in the interviews I did last year and I did about a, like maybe I talked to 30 different companies, maybe I did like 20, 25, some kind of technical and maybe uh, I think 11 on sites where I did like five plus hours. Only one person in a tech screen that I didn't do well at didn't allow me to Google. He was just like, why do you want to Google it? And I'm just like, because I don't know it. And he's like, no. And I'm like, okay, like, then I'm not going to know it. <laughs> so he just told me, I guess he Googled it or something. So I'm like, what's the difference between you telling me and me looking it up? Generally, they let you. Uh, it's not a big, it's not a big problem. Um, I, you know, very specific instances. People are going away from that whole, like, I remember when I did in, in university, like I had one math class where they didn't let you use a calculator. Like, I think it's kind of ridiculous, but, you know, like, uh, Googling is, is a skill that, you know, if you can arrive to the problem or you figure out what can help you with the problem, go for it. You never know. But yeah, um, let's see here. Are you on Twitter or can you anywhere we can follow you? Yes. So let me post my Twitter here. A lot of you know me from Twitter. 
So uh, here's my Twitter. Let me give you my LinkedIn as well. I mean, it's all on there. Okay. All right. So um, a little plug for myself here. Actually, I'll go ahead and post this here. Um, this is a course that I've been working on called Get Your First Coding Job. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to plug here, but I'll do it anyways. It's a course that I've uh, worked with uh, a lot of people who are trying to find their first coding job. Uh, it's I also work, I didn't mention, as a part-time bootcamp mentor with Springboard. Uh, I, on Twitter, usually try to help a lot of people that are beginners. And uh, this is a course I put together. Um, Stay tuned on that. If you follow me on Twitter, I will be posting a discount link on that pretty soon, a pretty significant discount. So you can hold off on buying or you can contact me directly to get a hold of that discount. So it's going to be something around 40 to 50 percent. I don't know yet. So uh, it just, you know, this course is something this is a second version of it where I've learned a lot about what you can do to get your first coding job if you don't have it yet. So anyways, um, yeah, see you later here. Uh, let's see what we have here with uh brian here i heard that most of the time a uh, few interview rounds uh let's see here you could have a four-hour interview how normal is that you can at least last four hours so you could have four hours but it doesn't usually mean it has to be in a row a lot of times they break them up sometimes over two days i like to do it just in one day when i was really crunching the interviews i had almost eight hours in a row with two different companies i went from like i think like it was spaced out a little bit, but it started, I started, my day started at 9 a.m. and ended at 9 p.m. when that company was in California, so I was able to go a little later. So I'm never doing that again, but that was straight technical interviews all day. My brain, it's never been, it was never more fried in my life. It was just nuked. Uh, it was just technical, 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 technical. My mouth was dry. It was just absolute brutality, but I needed to essentially get all my interviews in at around the same time. So my hopefully my offers come in at the same time so that I can use use that to negotiate a bit and have more options. See, I think I missed a question here from Karun. Uh, a common theme that I observe is what we should be able to explain our inner thoughts for our problem solve. I think I struggle with uh, talking through the pseudocode. I have to practice a lot. Okay, one thing you could do with this, that's a great question, Karun, is you could, um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, one thing you could do is practice with a friend. I know I recommended this to Ken before. Find a person to pair program with and pick a problem from Leak Code or Code Wars, which I like, and try to do it in front of a person. See how you do. Another thing that you could do is use a free platform like Pramp. Uh, Pramp has a lot of like free interviews here and uh, uh, where people kind of, you, you meet up and you kind of interview each other. One of you gets a question and the other person kind of goes through the question and they kind of rate you afterwards. So that's one thing that you could do as well. You can take that to a really high, like a way uh, different level here. This is what I did actually. And this is how I realized I was very terrible at uh, lead code style interviews. Uh, this is, where is it here? It's called interviewing.io. Here you pay, um, because here, here you pay actually like, in, there's anonymous real like Google, Facebook engineers, whatever, interview you with real questions. And uh, I, I paid for this and did a few of them and I failed miserably. And I realized like, wow, like I had already done like a couple of months of practice. Um, and I realized that like, I need to do a couple of more. And still what was interesting at the end is the lead code questions I was terrible at, even though I spent 90% of my time preparing for lead code questions. And most questions weren't type of lead code. They were like this. I just relied on my skills over the years. And because they're a little more practical, I can talk and walk, walk through and talk through them. So that was, I found very interesting, but interviewing.io is a more paid resource. Pramp is also paid, but there's some free options. Have you had an experience where you felt like you performed poorly in a technical interview, but the company decided to continue the interview process anyways? Yeah, I definitely had uh, had that um, inclination, especially with interviewers that have more straight faces in terms of like, or expressionless faces, uh, I guess is a better term. Uh, and uh, they, they just kind of like, you can't tell. And sometimes they end up being like, oh yeah, we have a great offer for you. Most of the time when I felt like I did poorly and it was true and I don't like that because like it's hard to negotiate when you do poorly, like it, the, really the leverage is on the company side and there's nothing you, if they want to level you down, give you a lot less money, you know, it's sometimes hard to be like, no. Right. So, but if you do really well, it's the opposite. Like 
you know, you, you essentially you could, like, I remember one big thing that happened was uh, I was trying to do all these interviews and some people would say like, you have two days to accept this offer. And I'd be like, I can't because I need to keep going. And, and I'd be like, yeah, I guess it expires. And, and, and it would never expire. In fact, they would prolong it to whatever I needed, offer even more money. Because sometimes if you do really, really well in an interview, uh, especially, you know, like companies that have hard interviews, it's really hard to find people that pass them. And, and they don't want to let you go there. They'd be like, you know, like, it's, we, you know, especially recruiters, they'd be like, oh, like 100 people failed, you passed or 10 people failed and you passed. Let's get you, you know, we really need to get this person. So that's one thing that you can do, especially how it was last year. Like there weren't a lot of jobs. Uh, there were a lot of jobs and a lot of candidates. Maybe things have changed. But, you know, when you do poorly, I think it's hard to negotiate. But sometimes you like, like I can be hard on myself and, you know, you end up doing well. You never know. Or sometimes you do bad in one interview out of like the four or five and then you get a pass altogether, people like vouch for you. Uh, yeah, so let's see here. Um, I think that I see, um, uh, I think that's answered all the questions. Anything else? Anybody have any comments? All right, so um, uh, in terms of mentees, currently right now, um, uh, I'm at capacity with Springboard, um, uh, but like if you have any questions here, um, feel free to ask me on Twitter or message me on LinkedIn. I can answer them when I can. I do offer uh, coffee chats here. They, obviously, they're free here, but uh, they do get booked up pretty quickly. There's there's a wait list for them. I meet with people uh, every week. Um, uh, hey, uh, Julieta, sorry about that. Like, uh, if you want, you can message me. We can work out to, uh, uh, you know, figure out if I can help you in any other way with this code. Maybe I can message you. Feel free to, to personally message me on uh, Twitter. And sorry, I didn't think about the accessibility part there, but um, maybe there could be some closed captions in the recording. I can bring that up to Code Mentor or message me directly about something that, that you want talked about, but I'll work to make sure there are closed captions. Is that all right for you, uh, Julieta? Thank you, Os. <laughs> Good to see you here, Os. Yeah, so um, hopefully everybody enjoyed this. I think uh, we're reaching towards the end. And uh, thank you, thank you. yeah, really great. Yeah, hopefully uh, you learned at least one thing. Feel free to message me. Uh, there's a lot more. There's more details on me on Code Mentor. I'm also on Code Mentor itself, although I don't really kind of do anything anymore uh, there, but. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm happy to help. And uh, thank you again so much for your time. Great amount of attendees. I really appreciate it. Uh, I might have a workshop next week that's also free. I'm not sure. It's for a conference. It's an online workshop as well. It's next week. Um, more midday for me. It's like it, I think it'll be more 11 a.m. EST. Um, I'm not sure if it's free yet. I will let you know. Follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn where I can announce it. Um, the week after that, uh, or sorry, next, um, I think next Friday on December 2nd, I'm speaking live at a Berlin React Day Berlin conference. Um, uh, let me see if I, I don't think I have that link available here. I don't think I have it available handy here, but if you check on my LinkedIn, I posted kind of a link there. If you want to speak, if you want to hear me speak, it's only like seven minutes. I'm discussing something. I know that live stream is free. Anyways, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. I hope the recording turns out very well and uh, have a great day. Have a great night. See ya.